Defend the weak, never fight in anger, and never let another creature take my sword from you. Hello and welcome. I'm Captain Rutledge. Let's round out this trilogy of adapting to PBS with the final series of Redwall to air on public television. This is Martin the Warrior, a tale of Redwall. The novel, Martin the Warrior, was first published in 1993 and tells the origin story of Martin the Warrior, who would later go on to build Redwall Abbey. While a slave in the fortress of Marshank, Martin vies to take back his father's sword from the stoat warlord Badrang the Tyrant. With help from Rose of Noonvale, her brother Brome, a mole named Grum, and a squirrel named Feldo, Martin escapes Marshank and travels the surrounding lands, making both enemies and allies, and forming an army to storm the fortress of Marshank, free the slaves, and take back his father's sword. In my humble opinion, Martin the Warrior is likely Brian Jakes' best Redwall novel. It has all the hallmarks of previous novels, mouth-watering food, riddles for characters to solve, and evil villains for heroes to defeat, but it also tries some new things. In previous novels, a character species pretty much determined whether they were good or bad. In Martin the Warrior, Jakes blurs the lines on a few creatures. Some characters, who would usually be good in other novels, are here fairly despicable creatures. And a few usually evil species aren't outright evil, just misunderstood. What's more, some previous Redwall novels would stick to one main adversary for the heroes, maybe a few minor ones scattered here and there. Martin the Warrior has two main villains for our heroes, Lord Badrang the Tyrant and the pirate Captain Traumon Josiah Cuttlefish Clog. While Badrang is far from the most humane individual, Clog is just as malign. If the two had ever joined forces, our heroes would never have stood a chance. But that's the thing. They both hate each other's guts. They want nothing more than to see each other festering in a shallow grave with a mouthful of flies. It gets so that escaped slaves are no longer their target, but rather control of the fortress of Marshank. True, Badrang may be pretty dull and Clog may not be very threatening, but it's their playing off of each other that makes them both stand out in the canon of Redwall villains. The other risk Jakes does with Martin the Warrior is writing in the deaths of some of the main characters. If you haven't read the book or watched the series, please do so right now, because there will be a major spoiler lying ahead. I can't think up too many gripes about the other parts of the book. The heroes are strong characters, the villains, although just fine on their own, play extremely well off each other, and the stakes are pretty high. Either overthrow Badrang, or risk being enslaved for the rest of your life. Now, on to the TV series. The TV series of Martin the Warrior aired on PBS starting in 2003, again produced by Nelvana and Alphanim. Compared to the previous series, Matameo, Martin the Warrior's animation is much higher quality and better detailed. The action scenes and fights are gripping, the backgrounds are well designed, and voice acting is again top quality. Amos Crawley voices Martin, Lindsay Connell voices Rose, Diego Matamoros returns to voice Badrang, although he sounds far too similar to Clooney, and John Stalker voices Clog. How does this series fare adaptation-wise? Well, let's find out. This series, much like Matameo, is extremely faithful to the original novel. The story starts with the Redwallers listening to the story of Martin the Warrior. Martin's father Luke sails off to fight pirates, leaving his sword to Martin before departing. One day, Martin's grandmother catches him far from home, when both are captured by Badrang and taken as slaves, with Badrang taking young Martin's sword for himself. Many years later, Martin attacks a guard about to whip an elderly squirrel slave named Barkjohn. Badrang sentences Martin to be picked to death by seagulls outside the fortress of Marshank. Meanwhile, Rose and her friend Grum are camping outside Marshank while looking for Rose's missing brother Brome. They see Martin tied up outside and resolve to help him out. When seagulls come to attack Martin next morning, Grum frightens off the birds by hurling stones, and Rose makes eagle calls. 
While all this is happening, Captain Clog and his crew are sailing into Marshank to settle some old scores with Badrang. When Badrang sees Clog's ship, he orders Martin brought back inside. Badrang offers Martin a spot in his horde, but Martin attacks a stoat and is thrown into a prison pit with Bark John's son Feldo, who had struck Badrang's fox captain Skalrag, and Rose's brother Brome. Clog enters Marshank and requests a few of Badrang's slaves to serve as row beasts on his ship, but Badrang refuses and throws the pirates out of Marshank by poison arrow point. That night, an otter slave named Kayla converses with Rose and Grum through song about Brome, and the Marshank slaves gather what food they can to feed Martin and the others. While pretending to have a bout of fever, Brome shouts out the prison pit's location to Rose and Grum outside, and both get to work tunneling into the pit under the fortress. As Grum and Rose get closer to the prison pit, Clog's pirates start laying siege to Marshank, and Badrang's fox captain Skalrag sabotages Clog's ship and longboats. In the confusion, Martin, Feldo, and Brome escape through Grum's tunnel and make off with one of Clog's longboats. However, the longboat is heavily damaged by Skalrag, and it takes on water. A large fish destroys what's left of the boat, and Brome and Feldo get separated from Martin, Rose, and Grum, but they all hope to meet up again at Noonvale, Rose and Brome's village. While Brome and Feldo wash ashore a short distance from Marshank and befriend a group of traveling actors called the Rambling Rosehip Players, Martin, Rose, and Grum are captured and enslaved by a tribe of pygmy shrews alongside a hedgehog named Palum. After Martin saves the life of the shrew queen's son, all four are set free and try to make their way towards Noonvale. On their way, they come across a mole named Polykin. She gives them provisions for their journey ahead, and, being somewhat clairvoyant, gives a set of directions towards Noonvale. Back at Marshank, Brome, Feldo, and the circus performers make plans to break out the other slaves, while inside, Kayla and Barkjohn plan an armed uprising against Badrang. A vol slave named Droop passes on their plans to Badrang, though. However, before Badrang can dig up their stash of secret weapons, Kayla had moved them to another spot of the slave compound. Clog and Badrang form an uneasy alliance to keep the remaining slaves from escaping Marshank, although Clog only complies to have his ship rebuilt. In good faith, Clog returns his prisoner Skalrag, though Badrang easily uncovers Skalrag as a spy and has him executed. One night, Balaw, a member of the Rambling Rosehip players, entertains Clog's crew with a short magic act, and convinces the stoked captain to allow the players into Marshank for a performance. The Rambling Rosehip players enter Marshank with Brome and Feldo in disguise. Clog enjoys the show, but Badrang is suspicious. While the players perform their tricks and plays, Feldo sneaks to the slave compound and he, Kayla, and Barkjohn set to work freeing the slaves. Droop wanders in and raises the alarm to Badrang. Feldo gets as many slaves as possible to escape the compound while Kayla volunteers to stay behind with the others. In confusion, Clog and Badrang's forces fight amongst themselves, giving the rambling Rosehip players time to escape Marshank with the slaves. Meanwhile, Martin, Rose, Grum, and Palum continue to Noonvale. They get attacked by a swarm of bees, but escape with help from Rose's singing. They encounter a monster called the Murdop, but really it's a family of rabbits, and they get captured by a tribe of carnivorous lizards that intend to eat them, but escape with the help of the Warden of Marshwood Hill. When the Warden is attacked by slow worms, Martin and company save his life. Badrang and Clog's alliance soon falls to pieces. Clog tries to take back some of the escaped slaves for himself, but Feldo, Balaw, and the Badger Roanoke send him off after killing a few of his corsairs with handmade javelins. Rome captures some of the pirates' gear and disguises himself as a sea rat, helping another injured sea rat named Wolp back to Marshank. While Clog and Badrang plan to assassinate each other, to unsuccessful results, Rome and Kayla take the remaining slaves to the prison pit and escape through the tunnel Grum dug out earlier. At one point, the escape tunnel caves in, but Kayla digs everybody out, and they have their first taste of freedom. Badrang and Clog find out and call a brief truce to retrieve the escaped slaves. Badrang comes close to capturing the slaves on a cliffside, but he and his horde are stopped in their tracks while trying to climb the cliffs, thanks to the newly dubbed Fur and Freedom Fighters. When Badrang returns to Marshank, he makes another startling discovery. Clog had double-crossed him and captured Marshank for himself. 
Thinking craftily, Badrang and his horde enter via the old escape tunnel. Badrang takes Clog as his new slave, and Clog's old crew are pressed into service with Badrang's horde. Meanwhile, Martin and company run afoul of the rowdy Gaw tribe squirrels. They escape after Martin beats the chieftain in a wrestling match, but are stopped once again when trying to climb a mountain. Martin tricks the Gaw tribe into giving them a head start in climbing, but the squirrels edge dangerously close to the heroes. Thankfully, Boulder the Owl swoops in in the nick of time and offers to lead the friends through the dark mountain passage on the route to Noonvale. They then travel by river to the village of Noonvale. Back at Marshank, Brome and Feldo make false wagon tracks for Badrang's horde, trying to track them down. They manage to trap the horde in a swamp, with Feldo slaying a few in the process. Feldo then taunts Badrang by hurling javelins into Marshank each evening. At one point, Badrang accidentally kills his own beast, thinking they were Feldo and the escaped slaves. Then, Badrang comes up with a plan. He meets Feldo outside Marshank for one-on-one -on -one combat. Just as Feldo gets the upper hand, though, Badrang calls out to his hidden army, who then attack and kill Feldo. In the nick of time, Brome, Barkjohn, and the Fur and Freedom Fighters make their way to lay siege to Marshank, but Feldo is already dead, and they get pinned down by Badrang's forces. In spite of Badrang's offers to take them on as his new slaves, the Fur and Freedom Fighters persist in their siege. At Noonvale, Martin meets Rose and Brome's parents. However, they reveal Brome hadn't returned yet. In spite of Noonvale being a peaceful community, Martin manages to rake up a few volunteers for battle against Badrang and Marshank. When they finally arrive at Marshank, Martin finds that Boldred assembled a full army with the Pygmy Shrews, the Warden, and the Gaw tribe. They arrive at the gates of Marshank to relieve the Fur and Freedom Fighters, but still don't gain any headway and have to retreat. Although Badrang feels he's won the day, Clog, who is by now demented, issues warnings of doom to Badrang and his horde. Back at the Fur and Freedom Fighters' camp, Martin and the others hatch a plan for a night attack against Marshank. They load up their old cart with hay and flammables and launch it into the wooden gates of Marshank. The Fur and Freedom Fighters assault the walls and parapets of Marshank and slay numbers of Badrang's horde. Badrang cowers in his quarters. He eventually comes out, sword in hand, and faces Martin in combat. Martin comes out on top, though, stabbing Badrang through the heart and finally reclaiming his father's sword. However, during battle, several of Martin's army are killed, including Rose, much to Martin's shock. When the battle is over, Kayla and Brome burn what remains of Marshank and offer those without homes to return with them to Noonvale. Clog, however, survived the battle and spent the rest of his days talking to the slain vermin in the ruins of what was once Marshank. Rose is buried on a hill outside Marshank, and Grom plants a rose on her grave. Martin becomes completely despondent after her death. While stopping by Polykins on the way back to Noonvale, Martin announces he's leaving and will never return. With one final song, his friends bid him farewell. Other aspects of the novel are kept intact. Balaw's little rhymes and ditties, Martin's fight with the Gaw tribe chieftain Waka, and even Polykin's rhymes telling the way to Noonvale. Quite a lot they kept in, right? Definitely. But there are still a few items they had to change up. In the TV series, the framing device for Martin's story has Matthias and Tim Churchmouse telling the story sometime after the events of Matameo. In the original novel, though, a group of travelers from Noonvale visit the Abbey during the time of Abbot Saxtus, some time after the events of the Bellmaker. The travelers include Albricia, the descendant of Brome, and Palum's descendant, Bulltip. Bulltip tells Martin's story to the Abbey residents, while Albricia gives them a locket containing a picture of Martin and Rose, along with a clipping of the rose Grum had originally planted on Rose's grave. Brother Simeon planted the rose in the Abbey Gardens, but since the rose always bloomed late, it became known as the Late Rose. The show writers likely excluded this framing device in favor of using one with already established characters. A number of characters in the TV series had their roles either significantly shortened or altered. 
including Kellandine, Hilgors, Juniper, Yarrow, Wolf, Starwort, and Marigold, Groot and Purslane, Trefoil, and Turgru. What's more, Kayla's voice differs somewhat from the novel. In the novel, he had a much deeper voice, compared with Noah Reed's higher pitch in the series. What'd they say? Just that it's cold down there. That's strange. I think it's quite warm. I hope they don't have... the fever. The TV series sees Martin's father Luke going out to destroy Badrang. However, the novel has him going out after a different Corsair, namely Philu Daskar. Scalrag employs Droop as a spy in a more secretive manner than in the TV series. In the novel, he makes contact with Droop while the Vol is busy with tasks around the compound. Additionally, the TV series has Scalrag being tickle tortured for information by Badrang, and then executed by being literally tickled to death. The novel just has him stretched out on the rack as torture, and then his body used as target practice by Badrang's archers. A stranger departure occurs with Palum. In the novel, Palum is a male, while in the TV series, Palum is female. Likely for more gender balance in the story, but it doesn't make too much of a difference compared to the novel. The novel also has the quartet staying longer with Polykin, giving time for her to stock their provisions and give them directions to Noonvale. Compared to the novel, the rambling Rosehip player's performance is shortened in the TV series. In addition to Balaw transforming a mug of grog into dead leaves and pulling an apple out of Clog's ear and making a disguised Feldo disappear, the novel also included a routine of Balaw stabbing the squirrel Kellandine with a trick dagger, then bringing her back to life. Droop's death is also changed. In the TV series, he tries to stab Barkjohn, but in turn gets stabbed to death by Feldo. In the novel, he gets stabbed by Feldo while trying to sneak away from the ensuing battle. In the novel, the Warden of Marshwood Hill is more of a grey character. When he saves Martin and company from the cannibal lizards, he doesn't throw the lizards into the river. Rather, he swallows them whole. There were also a few changes to the final Marshank escape. For one thing, Wolp never catches on to Brome being a mouse in the novel. While drunk, he almost reveals Brome is a mouse, but gets knocked out by Kayla. And during the cave-in, in the tunnel, Kayla didn't start digging due to a panic attack. It was more of a rage attack akin to the Blood Wrath. The TV show has Martin and the others traveling to Noonvale with the help of a tribe of fairy shrews and nearly going over a waterfall. The novel instead has them traveling to Noonvale with Starwort and Marigold and their riverboat Water Lily, rather uneventfully at that. Feldo's death is also changed from the novel slightly. The series has him tackling Badrang to submission, taking the stoat sword, and almost smiting him before Badrang called out the signal to his hidden troops. In the novel, Feldo bests Badrang with a javelin and beats the stoat in the same way Badrang had beaten the slaves of Marshank. As soon as the signal was called, Feldo was in an almost berserk state. He killed nearly 20 of Badrang's troops with a javelin in each hand before he was finally slain. Clog, meanwhile, isn't as demented in the TV show as he was in the novel. There, he is tasked with digging graves for the slain beasts. The monotony and his obsession with burying Badrang's dead, decaying body drove him insane, along with one point where Badrang threw him off the ramparts and he landed on his head. In the final act, the series writers added in a scene where Martin and Rose profess their love for each other, and Rose gives Martin a good luck kiss. This never happened in the original novel, but it does make Rose's death all the more biting. Speaking of which, the TV series has Badrang taking Rose hostage during the Battle of Marshank, forcing Martin to come out and fight him one-on-one. -on -one. As Martin makes his attack, Badrang accidentally stabs Rose with his sword. In a brief but intense scrapple, Martin commandeers the sword and runs Badrang through. The novel instead has Badrang realizing all is lost and attempting to escape through a tunnel that Grum was digging. Rose witnessed this and, to save Grum, attacked Badrang with her loaded sling. In rage, Badrang threw her against a wall, causing a fatal concussion. Martin, in a hot fit of rage, came at Badrang and the two dueled and then grappled over Badrang's sword. Martin got the upper hand and forced the tip of the sword straight through the stoat's heart, killing him instantly. The TV series has Martin abandoning his sword after the Battle of Marshank. In the novel, though, Martin keeps the sword with him, which he carries on his route to Mossflower Woods during the early events of Mossflower. On the whole, though, these changes aren't absolute deal-breakers. What about what was left out, though?
Some characters in the novel were left out altogether in the series. Boldred's family, Agril, a few of Badrang's horde, some of Clog's horde, and a few escaped slaves, and a few rambling Rosehip players. The only members of Martin's tribe we see in the show are him, his father Luke, and his grandmother Windred. In the novel, after Luke departed, an older mouse named Timbalisto was put in charge of the tribe. Martin resented this somewhat since he was Luke's only son and he felt he should share leadership. One of the reasons why he ran off to chop firewood and find food. Windred's death is left out of the show. In the book, Badrang transports them several miles overland to the location of Marshank, feeding, starving, and overworking them as they go. Windred, being an elderly mouse, naturally died part of the way through the journey. After Martin saved the pygmy shrew queen Nambala's son Dinger from an angry seagull, the stupid, spoiled creature naturally whacked Martin across the face with a stick. The queen, in turn, broke her son's whacking stick and gave him a good spanking. After all the misery Dinger had caused for Martin and his friends, Grum referred to Dinger's crying as one of the best sounds he had heard for a while. Hilgorse's fate is only implied in the TV series. In the novel, he is definitely slain by Badrang's horde while buying time for the others to escape. After every last slave is freed from Marshank, they celebrate a feast with the rambling Rosehip players. There's only a small sample of it seen in the TV series, but you better believe Jakes gives a full detail in the novel. Some of the Rosehip players and a few of the ex-slaves pitch in and create a whole banquet of delicious dishes, including cake and ale, plum pudding, cider, cheese, nut bread and honey, berry tartlets with yellow meadow cream, hot root soup, and burdock ale. One other delicacy left out of the TV show was a creation by Grum. After parting with the Warden, Martin, Rose, Grum, and Palum find themselves short on provisions. After foraging, they come back with a bounty of fruit, nuts, herbs, and mushrooms. Mushrooms and herbs were mixed with chestnuts for hot soup, while Grum mixed some wild plums and apples with flour, oats, and honey, and baked the mixture on a hot stone to create little cakes, dubbed his own experiments. These experiments soon proved valuable when meeting Boldred later on. Boldred's family in the book includes her husband Horty and her daughter Emilet. Emilet later became a skilled artist and drew the picture of Rose and Martin that Brome's descendant Abrisha passed on to the Redwallers. When Martin and company get through Boldred's tunnel in the novel, they find a large cherry orchard. Guarding the orchard is an elderly, grouchy hedgehog named Agril. At first, he doesn't take kindly to the intruders in his orchard, but after seeing Boldred, he decides to be more hospitable to them and gives further directions to Noonvale, along with pouring them all some of his home-brewed cherry cordial. Unbeknownst to our quartet, though, he spiked their drinks with sleeping potion so they wouldn't come back to his orchard. When Martin and company finally wake up on the water lily with Starwort, Boldred tells more about Agril. Had Boldred not intervened, the hedgehog would probably have administered lethal doses of sleeping potion. In Noonvale, both Grum and Palum interact with other townsfolk. Grum met up with his nephew Bungo again, who enjoyed hot soup as much as his uncle, and Palum became acquainted with a female hedgehog named Teaselpaw. Teaselpaw constantly offered Palum all sorts of food and took quite a liking to him. In fact, it's possible that the two married and became the ancestors of Bulltip. Just a fan theory, nothing ever acknowledged by Jakes. Several events of the Battle of Marshank in the novel were left out of the TV series. In addition to scaling the walls and burning the gates, a group of moles led by Grum tunneled under the west wall into the fortress. Also during the fighting, Wolp recognized Brom and the crowd of attackers as a sea rat who once nursed him back to health. Brom couldn't bring himself to kill Wolp since the rat had never done any harm to him personally. Instead, Brom set Wolp free and told him to run away and that he never wanted to see the rat's face again. So, final thoughts? Martin the Warrior is one of Brian Jake's best Redwall novels, so naturally, Martin the Warrior is likely the best of all three Redwall TV series. It plays very closely to Jake's original novel while still being its own entity and making itself suitable for viewing by all audiences. It's yet another great entry into the Redwall canon. Now, of course, there is the matter of Netflix about to take a stab at its own adaptation of Redwall, alongside a new TV series based off the adventures of Martin the Warrior. Patrick McHale is set to write the new shows 
and based off his work on Over the Garden Wall, and the fact that he used to be a Redwall fan, this series might just be a worthy contender against the old TV series that aired on PBS. Only time will tell, though, and in the meantime, Nelvana produced three serviceable adaptations of Brian Jakes' work, which will no doubt still be well-loved by those who watched them as young Redwall fans. And that about wraps it up, folks. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, feel free to like, subscribe, and share, and also leave a comment below. Until next time, I'm Captain Rutledge. Good day. And please remember, if one day you happen to be passing Redwall Abbey, be sure to visit us.